Haddad, Arco Magazine's Managing Editor. And on behalf of the magazine, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening to hear about the Sears Homes in Richmond from Rosemary Thornton, the country's number one authority on kit homes. Rose is the author of several books on kit homes, including the Sears Homes of Illinois, the houses that Sears built, and finding the houses that Sears built. And she will be selling a few of her titles um, tonight after the lecture. Rose has appeared on MSNBC, PBS's History Detectives, a es Biography, and the CBS Sunday Morning News. Her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and about 100 other publications. Rose has traveled to 24 states to give more than 200 lectures on Sears Homes, and I am thrilled to have her with us here tonight. This spring, I had the pleasure of spending a few hours with Rose and a few local kit home fans driving around Richmond in search of Sears homes. And Rose is here tonight to share some of the gems that she found on our adventure. Now, I turn it over to Rose. <laughs> and before I forget, that's my dear husband out there uh, hawking the books. You won't believe how the children's faces light up at Halloween when you drop this in their bucket. So, <laughs> highly recommend. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about Sears Homes. The Kit Homes of Richmond. That is a Sears Avalon, by the way, on the cover. Oh, first, real quick, how many people here have read my blog, SearsHomes.org? Sweet. And there is a Facebook group called Sears Homes, if you want to join. It's a lot of fun. How many people here live in a Kit Home? Come on, put them up high. I can't see. All right, very nice. Does anyone live in this house? The Avalon. Yay! <laughs> the Avalon's one of my favorites. Okay, I'm going to have to master this real fast. There we go. Carlinville, Illinois. Carlinville, Illinois has 156 Sears homes in a 12 block area. Actually, nine block. Yeah, it's nine. Who's heard of Carlinville? Yay! Allegedly, the Sears Carlin was renamed, it was known as the Sears Windsor, it was renamed the Sears Carlin in honor of Carlinville. And this, real briefly, it's a, it's a neat story. Standard Oil came to town, Standard Oil needs some worker housing, they turned to Sears, a million dollars worth of housing, so they ordered it's very cool. But the other neat thing is the building of Carlinville was supervised by a woman. Her name was Mrs. Spaulding, they called her the Lady on Horseback. They said that she would be that she would go around and hire these workers at night in the morning and they'd be fired by noon because their work was not up to snuff. She was a tough taskmaster. But Carlinville actually is the largest collection of Sears homes in a neighborhood. Nothing but Sears homes. They have eight models, nine blocks. They had 150, they had 156. Four had burned down, and then one was moved. But then recently. One was found to be a meth house, <laughs> and so it was burned down by the fire department, and uh, that's not good. And it's really very sad. Harlanville has uh, done nothing with this collection, which is why there's a meth house in Harlanville. They're having a lot of problems, a lot of rental property. The houses are all in terrible, but in marginal condition, like so. Roanoke Rapids has one of the largest collections of. Aladdin pit homes in this area. Uh, it is a town literally built by Aladdin. It was a mill town, and there are a lot of Aladdins. A lot of Aladdin. Streets, 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 streets of Aladdins. Elgin, Illinois. Anyone heard of Elgin, Illinois, where they make the watches and the clocks and stuff? Elgin has more than 210 <coughs> documented Sears homes. This is uh, the uh, something. This is a Sears Mitchell. Isn't that a pretty little house? See, people get this idea that Sears House have a certain look. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I'll talk about that in a minute. Hopewell does not have a lot of Sears on. Who's heard of Hopewell? <laughs> Hopewell has Crescent Hills, 44 Sears homes in Crescent Hills, but based on my opinion, I might need my lawyer to give me some advice here, but based on my personal opinion of those 44, 36 are not. And I don't know what happened in Hopewell. I've actually offered, and if anyone from Hopewell's here, I have offered to help them do a new survey for free and get to the bottom of this mess because last I heard they're still promoting it, which makes me very sad. What Aladdin, what Hopewell does have is one of the largest 
collections of Aladdin, of Aladdin worker industrial housing, Aladdin industrial housing, anywhere south of, uh, shoot, I don't know, DC, I guess, they had, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred maybe, and that's what happened to them. There's still a lot left. And while they promote the houses in Crescent Hills, they're not saying anything about street after street after street after street of Aladdin houses they have. And Aladdin is another kit home company like Sears sold kit homes in the early 1900s, a lesser known name, but actually a bigger presence here in Virginia because they had a mill at Wilmington, North Carolina. So not surprisingly, we have a lot more Aladdin than we do Sears. So it's a sadness to me that right here in Hopewell, I live in Norfolk, not far away, I'd be happy to help Hopewell figure this out, but uh, I think that last time I was in town, they burned me an effigy, so I don't know. I told somebody I might go to Hopewell today to take some pictures, and I said, I'm going to wear my fake nose and a wig. <laughs> Sears started selling kit homes in 1908. This is the cover of the 1908 catalog, Book of Modern Homes and Building Plans. When I first got into this, about 1999, I stayed up way too late writing my book, The Houses of Sears. Still, it's been about four years writing that book. Good golly, that was a lot of work. Uh, that I, as part of my effort to become an expert, I memorized each of the 370 designs Sears offered during their 32 years in the kit house, process, the kit house business. And I have a good memory for pictures. I have a real bad memory for faces, but a real good, real good memory for houses. So one night I was up too late working on my book, and I looked at that house on the cover, and I thought, boy, what model is that? And then I realized Sears never offered that model any time in their 32-year history. They just thought it was a good-looking house, so they stuck it on the cover. And if you look in the back, you see farm, the farmer there carrying his water out to the barn. We hope he's carrying the water out of his modern house and that he is not going out to the well to fetch water. However, he does have his trusty Sheltie at his side, so that's good. $11,500 will build this large modern brick schoolhouse. Schoolhouse number 5008 was the only schoolhouse they ever offered. I don't know what happened to number one through 5007. <laughs> True story, I gave, I've given this talk 250, 300 times, I don't know, but I gave this talk in Granite City, it wasn't in Granite City, where was it? I don't know, somewhere in the Midwest. And I gave this talk and a woman came up to me, she, I've seen that house, I've seen that house, I've seen that school, I've seen that school. I was like, okay, 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 where, 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 where? Well, she named the city about two hours away from where I was living, and I said, you're sure it's this building? Look at it close, oh yes, that's it, that's it, that's it. So I got in my car and I drove two hours to this place. She didn't give me good directions, I got to it, it was one story, had a gable roof and no dormers, but other than that, it was identical. <laughs> and now I ask for pictures. You wouldn't believe how many wild goose chases I've been sent on. Oh my goodness, I could do a lecture on wild goose chases. This is the floor plan for modern schoolhouse number 5008. I love this floor plan, very simple and to the point, but if you look at the top, it says future girls toilet, future boys toilet. I love that I see some kids saying, I gotta go to the bathroom. And the teacher says, in the future. <laughs> I love that. I just love, 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 love that. Ah, this is from the 1916 Modern Homes Catalog. This is a graphic. It shows dad looking at plans. The kids are getting ready to, I don't know if they're happy or getting ready to fight. Maybe little girls dreaming of their new house. Look how this couple is living. Look at that carpet, it's threadbare. You can see the floorboards through the carpet and then the, the gas flickery light. People, we romanticize gas lights. They were smelly, they were sooty, they flickered, they were kind of dim and yellow. Look at the curtains, they're also just shabby and pathetic, but th their life is gonna get a lot better. Materialization, they are building the Sears Sherburn, and what a fine looking house it is. Realization, there it is, the Sears Sherburn, 12,000 pieces of house and they found a place for all of them. No pocket screws left over. By the way, these came with 75 page instructions and 75 page instruction book and a promise that a man of average abilities could have it built in 90 days. One of my favorite stories came from somebody that said, I live in a Sears house and it was built in 1946. I said, well, that's interesting, but Sears actually stopped selling these in, 19, in 1940. She said, well, you understand, uh, the family started in 39 and finished in 46. <laughs> Now, we have gratification. The gas lights are gone. Check that out. They have electric lights. They have a fine fireplace. Forget the fact Sears never offered any fireplace anything like that, 
but what the heck? Why let details get in the way of a good story? The children are dancing a jig, the carpet looks a lot better, and the library table has grown a marble top. Lots of wonderful things happen when you get in your Sears house. Uh, Pre-World War I Sears homes are very, very, very unusual. Um, the great majority of Sears homes you're going to find are going to be post-World War I to about 1930. And that's for a lot of obvious reasons. Housing starts plummeted in 32. Uh, and you know, a lot of people think the Depression started October 29. That was just kind of the opening bell, literally. The, the, the ripples into the housing market took a couple of years. So it's really about 31 that the housing starts drop. But according to the Wall Street Journal, housing starts dropped 40%. They reported this in January 32, so it would have been for 31. 40% drop in housing starts uh, in the early 30s, so that was a big drop. So you're just not going to find a lot of post-1930 Sears homes. And briefly, Sears offered mortgages, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but Sears stopped offering mortgages uh, in 1933 because as the originator of a mortgage, as the holder of a mortgage, they were put in a terrible spot when people couldn't make their payments on them. And I actually talked to a grandson of a man whose family had bought and built a Sears home, had a Sears mortgage on it. When they couldn't keep up the payments, Sears foreclosed. Well, it was a public relations nightmare, literally, in every way. And the grandson was telling me that they had a tradition in their family that they would never, ever, never patronize Sears again. So, I mean, 70 years later, it left an impression with this young man. So Sears ended up writing off $13 million in bad debt, and when people, um, people would then write to say they couldn't make their payments, Sears would say, just do the best you can. Pay what you can when you can, because they were done with the eviction business. It was a nightmare for them, I'm sure. Sears offered 370 designs. In the 1920s, each catalog had about 100. In the 1908 catalog, they started with, I think it was 22 designs. And then through the years, they add designs and take off designs. By the way, you see a fish pond in the front of this 1922 catalog. That's a Lexington in the background. Back in the 20s, everyone had the fish pond. It was kind of the 1920s version of Xanax and Valium. You'd go sit by the pond and meditate. Isn't that neat? A big selling point of the Sears homes and the kid homes in general was give the kiddies a chance. The idea was, and it's true, in the early late 1800s, early 1900s, only uh, four out of five children made it past 18. So one out of, if you had five kids, the odds were that you would lose one to disease. And it was, uh, uh, it was catastrophic. I was talking about on adding briefly. I did a lot of research on diphtheria. I was reading the old newspapers in Lake Mills, Wisconsin, and came across a family with eight children. When the diphtheria epidemic came through town, this farm family lost seven of their eight children. One diphtheria epidemic, and the paper reported that the eighth is doing poorly. So you can, and then paper, it's interesting, attributed it to bad blood. You know, we just didn't have an understanding in the 1870s and 80s of what was happening. So the idea of getting children out of tenements, out of the city, out of the slums, it was widely believed if you wanted to give your children a chance in life, you got them out of the cities. You got them away from the slums, you got them away from dirty living. This is a picture from Philadelphia. Uh, the picture was from the late 1920s. Any guesses what they're doing to that building? Painting it. Painting it? Any other guesses? Washing. washing it. They're washing the soot off the building. The building had been built five months prior. Soot was a nasty bit of business. We were burning coal for industry, for home heating, for home cooking, and for transportation trains. Soot was filthy. The, according to the graphic or the uh, picture, this is a 1930s health textbook. And the point of it was stay away from the cities and watch out for lung disease. Lung disease took out a lot, a lot, a lot of children. There are stories that you could not hang your wash in the yard because the soot would destroy your clothes. Stories of women trying to grow vegetable gardens and the soot killed everything. Flowers died from the silk. Can you imagine, or the soot? Can you imagine what that did to a child's lungs that was living in it? This is my great uncle. This is Addie's nephew. My, let's see, this was my great grandmother's eldest son. Ernest Ernie Eugene Whitmore died at the age of six, cause of death, scarlet fever. 
they were living out in Denver, and the family had, had been in Lake Mills, Wisconsin. They moved out to Denver. Uh, it was my great-grandmother got married and moved out with her new husband. They had three children. The two children, uh, I'm sorry, the two adults came down with scarlet fever. The three kids came down with scarlet fever. They sent for mom, still living in Lake Mills, said, look, we're all very, very ill. We need your help. Mom came out from Lake Mills to be with a family. She arrived December 1st on the day the boy died. Mom contracted scarlet fever and died six months later. Not a good way to go. She actually died from, it got to her heart. So this was, this was uh, a big deal. And then I want to read this. I'm not going to read much, but I want to read this. Has anyone ever heard of New Thought? It was kind of a religious movement in the late 1800s. Anyone heard of it? The idea behind New Thought was if you thought better, you would have better health. You had to monitor your thoughts in order to have better health. And the, the, the crux of New Thought was that you had committed a sin or you were holding a grudge, or there was some, something unholy in your mental state, and that's why you were sick. You committed a sin. Sin leads to sickness. So when they had, when germ theory was discovered, it was radical. Uh, disease was most often deemed the act of providence, chastening, for, or, or as chastening in this nation, moral evil. Many diseases are now known to be merely human ignorance and uncleanliness. The sins that humanity suffers are violations of the laws of sanitation and hygiene and simply the one great law of absolute sanitary cleanliness. Every symptom of preventable, preventable disease and communicable disease should ask the question, is the cause of this illness an unsanitary condition within my control? Well, I find that almost jarring because then if your child dies, was it because your house wasn't clean enough? I mean, it was, it was really chilling. And then briefly, and this is really interesting, this, this comes back to architecture. The intention is to avoid everything superfluous, everything that has a tendency to catch and hold dust or dirt. Wooden bedsteads are being replaced by iron or brass, stuffed and upholstered furniture by articles of plain wood and leather. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All other superfluous articles are much less fashionable. They, act, this book was published in 1908, they actually recommended washing down your bed with kerosene to sterilize it. <laughs> True story. Ice boxes were to be washed out with kerosene and scalding the water once a week. So the idea was that we knew what was killing children. We knew what was killing people. And it was big houses. And that's why the Victorian style house went away in a big hurry. It was the germ theory that really ended the reign of that house. And we went to little bungalows because we could keep them clean. And now we knew what caused disease. And now, you know, these women were going to make sure that they kept their house clean. And again, the graphics are very much child-centered because it was such a different time. It was such a different time. You go back and read the papers of the day, you realize there was nobody in your community that hadn't lost a child. It was just... It was just part of living in that time. So in focusing on children, it helps out. Plus, I love this graphic. I'm a survivor of having three older brothers, and I can tell you the only time I would have been pulled in a red wagon, I would have been duct taped and headed for a cliff. <laughs> but it is a darling little picture, isn't it? Mommy's back there with her darling egg. But look, little sis knows what's up. She knows where they're going. Oh, I love this picture, too. It looks like they're getting ready to push a plunger and blow that killborn to kingdom come, doesn't it? You got to blow it up last time. The Sears Sherburn at the top. Paint your house like one of these. Sears also sold paint. Sirocco, Sears Robot Company. Sirocco Paint. I love these pictures. That's a catalog. 19, I think it's 1920 catalog. That is Sears Modern Home number 119 on the cover. And they did sell barns too. They sold kit barns. There was a 40 acre mill in Cairo, Illinois. And that is how you pronounce it. Anyone ever heard of Cairo, Illinois? Yay! 40 acres, 20 acres under roof. It was a huge, huge mill. And when you bought a Sears house, it was milled at Cairo. They chose Cairo because it was at the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi. It had four major rail lines. I mentioned 12,000 pieces, a 75 page instruction book. It was loaded in a boxcar and sent out to wherever. Somebody said that they ship them many other ways. I have heard they, there were a few shipped by barge and that they were often driven by truck. There are, not surprisingly, many Sears homes in Cairo, Illinois, and I imagine they were driven by truck, not put on a boxcar. But 12,000 pieces of house would fit on one boxcar. 
Look how they pack it. It's very careful packing. 75 page instruction book. Told you where all those pieces and parts went together. You better read it carefully. Sears promised that if you follow their directions, you cannot make a mistake. <laughs> I bet I could. The lumber was numbered to facilitate construction. It was a letter and a three digit number. This today is a great way for authenticating Sears homes. Just to go in your basement. Next time you visit your friends, say, let me through, I'm going to the basement. And look and see if there are any marks on the lumber. It's typically going to be two to six inches from the end. And the font, uh, it's about seven eighths of an inch tall. This is another Sears house. This is actually a Sears Osborne. This is from uh, a late, let me get this right, the second floor choice. This, I think, is from a uh, 1930s Sears house. Because, see how it's stenciled? There's a difference between stenciling and uh, the solid letter we saw before. So they changed the patterns a little bit. And this is from um, a Gordon Van Tyne house. And Gordon Van Tyne was another company. There were six companies doing this on a national level. Sears, Aladdin, Gordon Van Tyne, Slash, Montgomery Ward, they were one and the same, Harris Brothers, Sterling Homes, and Lewis Manufacturing. They were six companies selling kit homes nationally. There were countless regional companies, countless. This is an Aladdin house. You'll actually see words stamped on the, uh, on the lumber of an Aladdin house. Dormer roof, window, it's going to actually be words. And this is something I often find, again, this is stencils, but this was part of the wooden crate used to ship that house out to, uh, actually this was Sydney, Illinois, and it went to the Bond Guard, Illinois train depot. And the fellow, Mr. Moore, was so pleased to be building a Sears house, apparently he saved this off the shipping crate and just nailed it. We're actually looking at the floorboards of the house. Isn't that cool? So when you're looking to authenticate a Sears home, you're looking for lots and lots and lots of stuff, not just one thing. I love this house. It's in Columbia, Illinois. They were so proud of their Sears Valonia, they turned the treads and risers wrong side out. So everybody would know they had a Sears house. By the way, has anyone seen the Buster Keaton short one week? Nobody's ever. Hey, hey, hey from, did you see it from my website? How'd you see it? I think, uh, I think it was for a college class. College class. Well, Buster Keaton did a short called One Week. It was, I think, 1920. And in the short, Buster Keaton is freshly married, and his new wife's ex-boyfriend is just pea green with Ellen and with envy. So he 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 uh, goes to the house. They have been bought a kit house as a wedding present. He goes to the house and he changes all the numbers on the lumber. <laughs> He turns the three into an eight, he turns the I into you know, something else, it changes all the numbers. Well, of course, the house they create is just this monstrosity. I should put a picture up here. It's just awful and it's absolutely hysterical. But the reason I love that, it really shows the context that in 1920, this was a silent film. Enough people would get it. <clears throat> that, oh, that's a kid house. Oh, look, somebody's messing up all the numbers on it. And now he's trying to build it. Nothing's in the right place. So this was a, a big deal. All in all, probably about 250,000 to 300,000 kid homes were sold just from the uh, national companies. That doesn't touch on regional, so that's a lot. Of kid homes. We'll do questions and answers in just a minute. Uh, this is uh, the back of a board. I think this was a baseboard, actually. Yeah, this was a baseboard. And this was from Quinter, Kansas. And this was a man named... Uh, Oh man, Matthias Ringer, that was his name. And this is a Montgomery Ward house. So again, you're gonna be looking for a lot of stuff in a lot of places. This is another way of identifying your kit homes. Because this is a complicated <coughs> joint at the base of the stairs, you'll often see these plinth blocks. And it's just a way to make the joinery work for a neophyte home builder. Isn't that a great idea? But if I walk in a house and I see this plinth block at the complicated joints, I'm like, ooh, let me take a better look. Shipping labels, you often find this on the back of millwork and windows and such as that. And some of these, I don't know if this one says it or not. Yeah, it says from 925 Holman Avenue, but it doesn't say Sears anywhere, anywhere. That was the headquarters of Sears in Chicago at that time period. And by the way, anyone heard the brand name Hobart? Sears, uh, name for water heaters and plumbing and such. Sears was located on the corner of Holman Avenue and Arthington Street. So they made Hobart 
the, you know, combination of the street names. Uh, the surface mount hinges are a way to identify Sears home or kit homes in general. And again, this doesn't mean you have a Sears home, but it means, you know, you need to take another look. The uh, framework was pre-mortised and came ready to receive the, uh, the hinge. But you wouldn't know exactly where that hinge is going to land on your door. So they would actually uh, uh, use these surface mount hinges. Pretty distinctive. Ephemera, uh, blueprints. Had somebody find some blueprints up in the attic that had an honor built seal in the corner of them. That was very cool. Uh, this is my book, Sears Homes of Illinois. It is about the books, the homes of Illinois, but also guidebooks can help you identify houses. Just open them, compare the house to the, the, the house you're looking at to the house in the pages. Sears Homes of Illinois has, uh, I guess it's about 100 of the best-selling Sears Homes. Houses by Mail, not my book, but a nice and wonderful resource, has the three, all 370 houses that Sears offered. The problem is, I've never seen uh, 150 of the houses in that book. So I suspect a lot of those 370 were either ne never built or not many of them built. I love this. This is a mortgage application for a Sears house. <laughs> Do you have a job? You got a mortgage. And getting a mortgage from Sears was just like walking up to the bank and getting handed a whole lot of money. One of the selling points in the small print of the 1916 Modern Homes catalog said, Captains of industry have become fabulously wealthy by plunging deep into debt, and you can too. <laughs> Monthly payments as low well as 35 to 45 bucks a month. This was actually, Sears was very progressive for its time. Uh, you're going to find Sears homes were purchased by uh, an abundance, a uh, disproportionate majority of uh, men and women of color and immigrants because redlining was the order of the day in the early years of the 20th, 20th century. And we talk about redlining now, but a lot of people don't even know what it means. Back in the day, if you didn't live in the right neighborhood, uh, you know, they actually would draw a line around the neighborhoods they'd write mortgages on. And if you were on the wrong side of that red line, you didn't get a mortgage. And the beauty part about Sears was if you had a job, you got a mortgage. Yeah, well, if you had a job and you owned your lot, that was it. In fact, that prior slide doesn't say job, it says, do you have a vocation? Which I think is great. Do you know how to do anything? So, <clears throat> it was a big deal uh, and gave people an opportunity to buy a house who would probably otherwise not have had an opportunity. Sears kit homes were kits pre-cut. They came from the factory, all the pieces and parts ready to nail together. I love this ad on the back of a catalog. Hang your saw on a nail all day. You don't even need it to build a Sears kit home. And by the way, uh, Gordon Van Tyne, one of the national companies, estimated the average two-room bed bungalow would require 4,000 cuts with a handsaw. That's a lot of cutting. And the Montgomery Ward slash Gordon Van Tyne would promote this, saves 30% on money and time. And that was actually probably about right. People say, well, why would somebody buy 12,000 pieces of house and put it together themselves? Well, one was pride of ownership and two was money. It would save you anywhere from 30 to 50% of a traditional stick-built house to buy a kid home. So it's quite a motivator. That's the kind of marks you're going to find on your Montgomery Ward house. It's a letter and some numbers separated by a uh, dash. Richard Warren Sears, my hero. He had one of the first phones ever installed at his office there in uh, uh, Chicago. And the other phone, again, one of the first telephones in use, and this would have been, I guess, I guess the 1880s or 1990s maybe. The other phone was installed in Oak Park, Illinois, in his mama's house. I tell my children frequently, that's a good son. <laughs> and you see he's holding a catalog. I love Richard Sears. 100,000 100, item within its 1,400 pages. One of the great stories I tell, Richard Sears was raised in a farmhouse, as were most people at this time. And he knew how life worked at the farm, and the women were always busy tending to things and tidying up. Well, he purposely made the Sears Roebuck catalog a little bit shorter and a little bit narrower than the Montgomery Ward catalog, knowing that when it was time for the house to be tidied up, the housewife would stack the Sears catalog on top. 
he, he actually started this after Montgomery Ward. Aaron Montgomery Ward started selling mail order items a few years before Sears. And businesses would boast that they'd been in business, you know, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. Well, Sears knew, being the new kid on the block, he didn't really have much to show. So on the cover of his catalog, he put Year Incorporated, and he put it in Roman numerals, so nobody's really sure when he started doing business. <laughs> I love that story. During World War I, the Great War, we were talking about that earlier, the number one most requested book by our young soldiers recovering in typically French hospitals overseas was the Sears Roba catalog. They just wanted a piece of home. Isn't that great? Julius Rosenwald, who was who became the uh, the CEO of Sears, the head of Sears, he actually got on board a ship with several wooden crates of Sears Roebuck catalogs and sailed them himself over to the French hospitals so these young men could have their Sears Roebuck catalogs. Isn't that a great story? And having just learned a little bit more about World War One, the German U-boats uh, made travel to Europe incredibly dangerous, incredibly. So for Julius Walt Rosenwald to personally take these crates and crates, there's a story that one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, stewards at the dock went to load one of these wooden crates of Sears Roebuck catalogs and turned to Mr. Rosenwald and said, man, what is in these boxes? Because <laughs> they were so heavy. Uh, Richard Warren Sears, by the way, left Sears in 1908. It was the height of a panic. There had been a panic in 1907, which we would call a depression. And uh, Sears and Rosenwald was already a partner at that point. But the two were at loggerheads as the best way to weather the economic storm. So Sears left a meeting they had in 1908 and said, I'm done, I resign. And he said, actually, he sold his, his interest. He said the reason he quit was he didn't find the work fun anymore. He was 44 years old. He had turned $5,000 worth of pocket, or I'm sorry, $50 worth of pocket watches into a $13 million empire by 1908. And that was when a million bucks was real money, you know. Uh, he died six years later at the age of 50. I always thought it was the thrill of running that business that kept it going. This is a floor plan for the Sears Lexington. I love it because it shows space for piano, space for lamp, space for dining room table, space for kitchen, space for everything. And it was, he started selling homes because it was a way to sell more of the stuff in his 100, uh, 1400 page, 100,000 item catalog. So it's just a marketing ploy is how it started. WLS stands for world's largest store. Just a couple years after Sears started the radio station in Chicago, they sold it, and now everyone's forgotten that WLS stands for World's Largest Store, but it was a marketing arm for Sears. By the way, we have WGH in Norfolk, which is World's Greatest Harbor. Back in the day, I actually uh, went to school to be a uh, radio person, so, huh, anyway, I know a little about radio. As I mentioned, there's more Aladdins than Sears in the southeastern United States. Again, we have little brother pulling little sister, but this time she has a parasol, so if he tries anything, she'll probably use it like a spear. At least she should. By the way, anyone else have three older brothers that tormented them? We're talking hung upside down from a tree with a rope. <laughs> not that I hold it against him, mind you. Aladdin was actually bigger than Sears, but not as well known. Uh, Aladdin sold more than 75,000 kit homes, and they were in business till 1981. Sears was gone by 1940. As you can see, there's that Aladdin company of Wilmington, which is probably why we have so many kit homes in Virginia from Aladdin. And they also had a mill out in Portland, and uh, one, of course, it was based in Bay City, Michigan. And it was named Aladdin after the genie who built his master a house in a day. Don't you love those shoes? And just in case the magic doesn't work, he's got a hammer. Just in case. By the way, that's an Aladdin kimono that he's pulling the curtain on. Here's the Sears Avalon. Love this house. Close up of it. Look at the three vents in the gable end. Let's see. I have a pointer. 
Yeah, check that out. Look at the little space between the columns. Look at the railing. And look at that cute little indent and that little, uh, what do you call, belt course there. Isn't that a darling house? Be still my quivering heart. And look at that. Isn't that nice? There's a close-up on that detail on the chimney. And there it is. Isn't that neat? There's the Avalon again. And there's another one. And look at the railing, original railing. That's pretty rare. Most of these railings are long gone after 90 years. But there it is. And you know another uh, funny feature about this one is look how that middle column is much shorter than the other two that have the actual supports on. Isn't that great? And that it from another angle. Again, the Avalon. And here's another one. This might be my favorite. Look at that house. Isn't that sweet? Oh yeah. Again, the Avalon. And then this one's been this one's been through some significant remodeling, but it's still an Avalon. So all together, I found five Avalons in Richmond. And what's so interesting about that is in all my travels, I found five Avalons in the country and five in Richmond. So what I suspect is a builder built an Avalon, and then he liked the, the house so much, he used the blueprints and kept on going, which people did sometimes. The Phoenix. Look at the, uh, one of the unusual details is that's actually what they call a buffet window. There's a built-in buffet on the other side of that. Look at that funny little window between the two, and then there's a little bit of spacing between these windows here. Now, I think that's a phoenix, but I'm not sure. That's part of the challenge of this. The, the porch is different. You'll notice, uh, you know, porches come and go. Porches get changed. And my impression is it's a little bit wider than, a, than the uh, phoenix. But if I were doing a comprehensive survey of Richmond, I'd sure take another look at that because I, my gut feeling is that is indeed a phoenix. 30%, 30% or more of Sears homes were customized when built. And the number one customization was they made it a little bit bigger. That's the Sears Sherburn, the one we saw the, uh, the realization and the, the kids dancing a jig. That's a color picture, as such as it is. And there it is, right here in Richmond. This is so distinctive because it's got that bracket in it. And that's a pretty unusual feature. You can see it better there. Look at that. And again, the porch is a little bit different. Well, I'm not too worried about that. That's a, there's a lot of distinctive stuff going on with that house. Modern home number 190. Prior to 1918, Sears homes had uh, numbers, not names. After 1918, they were given names. That uh, bay window is actually on both floors, upper and lower. Kind of an unusual looking house. But there it is, here in Richmond. And I've only seen one of these in the country, and that was in Edwardsville, Illinois. So this is number two. And you know, one of the neat features, you see this has the big old, uh, uh oh, ah, shoot, technology. It's not my friend. Okay, big old cornice return. See that? And that has it as well. And the windows are all in the right place. The Sears Wesley, this was a hugely popular house. See that the back roof is truncated, doesn't go down as far as the front. There she be. Isn't that neat? Oh, you know, an interesting little stat. 90% of the people living in these houses, uh, actually it's probably more like 80% now. When I started this 15 years ago, 90% of the people living in these houses didn't realize what they had until I knocked on their door and told them, or until they discovered it on my blog. It's so funny, back in the day, I'm highly allergic to people, but back in the day, I was so excited, I went out the door, ah, my name's Rosemary Thornton, I'm author of some books, you have a Sears house, and they would always say, no, 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 this is not a Sears house. And then they would always say, what is a Sears house? <laughs> and I loved it that they were so sure they didn't have it, but they had no idea what it was. But then invariably, what would happen next is the husband or wife would, literally send me an email, sometimes call me up, and say, 
I think my spouse needs an intervention. They won't stop reading about Sears homes. So it really is uh, a fun topic. This is a Strathmore. This is one of my favorites. Oh, what a pretty house. Look at that. Isn't that neat? And look at that. I, you know, I know there's a word for it. But the uh, little extension that comes down. And look, it's got a hospitality seat. That's what they call those. A hospita hospitality bench. That's what they call them. Isn't that darling? Right here in Richmond. And it's a beauty. Wait, do we, is that no matter here? No. Oh, okay. All right. But look at that. Isn't that just darling? And if you look at the wind, oh shoot. If you look at the windows down the side, little window, big window, small window, door, window. And then there it is. Oh yeah. And it's got a slate roof. People sometimes think it can't be a Sears house if it has a slate roof or brick, but the masonry was not part of the kit. You would obtain that locally due to the freight and the cost of the shipping. Uh, but the slate, Buckingham slate, uh, I bet you that is Buckingham slate, I don't know. Slate weighs, four, Buckingham slate, weighs 1,400 pounds a square. So the roofs have to be built special, extra heavy duty, to accommodate the tremendous weight of a slate, a Buckingham slate roof. There's a book called The Slate Bible. Anyone read it? I highly recommend it. Uh, one of the great stats from that book is 30% of the building materials we have in, 30% of the material we have in landfills right now is building materials. And 35% of those building materials are roofing materials. Buckingham Slate will last for, oh, I don't know, about a thousand years. And there's so much bad information about slate roofs. If you really want to go green one, stop tearing down houses made of, of lumber from virgin forests the likes of which we will never, ever, never, ever see again in this country. These houses were from, uh, were milled from lumber that grew in what we call a first growth virgin forest, where the trees grew very, very slowly, competing for nutrients and air and water and sunlight. And as a result, the wood is very dense and very heavy. So every time you tear down an old Sears house or an Aladdin house, and it happens, it's happening a lot. I get a lot of emails from people saying, help, help, we're losing a Sears house in our town. And invariably, once I write a really good blog about it and spend hours accumulating photos and doing research and doing, you know, going to Ancestry, blah, 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 invariably it gets torn down. I have yet to have any success in saving a good house. It's kind of getting to me. Anyway, but yeah, Buckingham Slate is very common around here because of the uh, proximity to Buckingham County. The Osborne, isn't that a pretty house? Close up. They call those oriental peaks on the top. Isn't that great? <laughs> not, all, not all of them have them. So I guess, you know, once you're coming down the home stretch, you're building your Sears house, and you're like, you know what? I'm not going to fiddle with those peaks. And that's right here in Richmond. What are the odds they know that's a Sears home? We, we, I thought it felt like walking up to the door. Um, we pass it every day. Morning. It's a beauty, isn't it? I love the Osborne. Anyway. I spend way too many hours of my life doing this at home, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's just like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Anyway, I'm very easily entertained, actually. Remarkably so. That's a pretty house, though, isn't it? Aladdin, I mentioned Aladdin. This is the cover of a 1931 Aladdin catalog. I love this cover, because it shows, it looks like Mom has been off to visit Timothy Leary. Look at Mom. <laughs> Yeah, mom is feeling no pain. And then the best part, I don't know if you can see it, but there are fairies in the trees. Oh, look, one of them's playing three flutes at once. When was the last time I saw that? Hmm. Isn't that great? Oh, what did I just push? Yeah, I love that picture. Dad's like, just keep dreaming, honey. Anyway, uh, this is the Aladdin Madison. And the good news is it's a true American home. It actually came in several floor plans. It ultimately came in four floor plans. You see the little recessed entry and the cute little chimney on the front. Cute little house. This is probably, this is probably one of Aladdin's most popular homes, certainly for the 30s. And there's the floor plan that shows the uh, extended, uh, it had three bedrooms instead of the two. There it is. And it's a secret. It's on Patterson Street. <laughs> 
instead of the traditional bump out. Uh, if you look at the old Aladdin catalogs, you could, it was like power windows and locks. You could upgrade. You could add porches. You could add uh, sweeping porches, which were hugely popular back then. You could add options. You could, you could make it any way you wanted to. The Ardmore. I have never in my time on earth seen an Aladdin Ardmore. Look, see what a distinctive house that is? It's got that open porch on the side with an arch. See that? I think that's it. I think it's, I don't know if it's been added on to or was uh, built that way, but I think there's probably a 70% chance that's an Aladdin Ardmore. Again, if I were doing a comprehensive survey, this was a windshield survey. This was riding around looking at houses. We had fun, didn't we, Molly? We had a blast. There were six people in Molly's SUV. That was so much fun. Anyway, I think that is, could well be an Ardmore. The Aladdin Plaza. That was, again, very in the 20s. That might have been their best-selling house. Again, this is an Aladdin kit home. And I think this might be one. I give this an 80% chance. You see the unique bracketing under the eaves? That is traditional Aladdin bracketing, which is kind of distinctive. That is a Gordon Van Tine Sussex. This was a little testimonial booklet that uh, Gordon Van Tine put out. And it was just story after story from happy, happy homeowners who had purchased a Gordon Van Tine encouraging others, and they called it a testimonial booklet. And that is a Sussex, and I think as the prior slide showed, that we've only found four Sussexes in the country, and it's a, it's a nice house, nice big house. Isn't that a pretty house? I really like that. And that is Molly's house. Remind me, Molly, did you know that was a kid home before we talked? No. no. And I think it's on the market, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> isn't that a sweet thing? See how entertaining that could be just for hours, you know? Oh, yeah. And then this is also a Gordon Van Tine house. House plan number 124. I don't suppose this homeowner's out here, is he? Ah, send him a note. Uh, beautiful stucco home, house plan 124. And it was only $1,449. This is really cool. This E.W. Farley built this Gordon Van Tine house in Virginia. And I'd seen this before when I was reading the catalogs. But then I saw that house here in Richmond. And I was like, oh my goodness. And we, uh, a couple of my buddies went to Ancestry and found that it was E.W. Farley's house. So that's his testimonial. I enclose here with three photographs. Modified plan number 124. He was one of the 30 percenters. We're more than pleased with everything you've sent us and entirely satisfied. We would not care to make any charge for the photographs. Sears, I know, would say, if you will send us a photo, we will send you a dollar. There it is. E.W. Farley's Gordon Van Tine number 124. Isn't that sweet? A very popular four-bedroom bungalow. Again, this is Gordon Van Tine. I was kind of puzzled to see so much Gordon Van Tine. They were based in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, I'm not sure how you ended up with so many of them, but often what would happen is there'd be a couple of these sold in town, and people would look at the quality of the building materials and say, hey, man, how'd you do that, and where'd you get it? And word spread very successfully by word of mouth. Gordon Van Tine, number 507. Oh, yeah, baby, there it is. Isn't that neat? <laughs> and Leslie Ann, who's here. Wait, Leslie. This is Leslie's photo who she got for us. And then I ask, I ask people, I say, listen, I need a photo. I need a photo from the same angle as the catalog page. And I get a photo that isn't even in the neighborhood of the catalog page. I'm like, come on, really? But this was perfect. Look at that. And uh, Leslie Ann and I were talking earlier, and she says, um, what was it that this house has been through some hard times? Three foreclosures. Three foreclosures. So that's a shame. Harris Brothers, one of the companies I mentioned is a national company. Harris Brothers, whoopsie, 1017. Again, distinctive features, little windows flanking the, I don't know if that's a fireplace or not. 
Uh, it's got two windows on either side of the front door, which you can barely see from this photo. And there it is. Harris Brothers number N1000. And if you notice, the front porch is rounded. Isn't that a neat little feature? Can you all see that in the floor plan? Nice, huh? There it is. And you have, I lost count. Jessica, do you remember how many of these we found? Four or five? And here's the thing. It was also offered as a pattern book house. And a pattern book was very similar to a kid home. But with a pattern book house, you'd look through the pages, pick out your house, send in uh, 10, 20, 30 bucks. And they would send you the blueprints and all the, the a complete list of all the building materials you need to build a house. So it was just uh, the pattern and the blueprints and a, a, an inventory list. There were no building materials. You obtained those on your own. But the problem is that Harris Brothers, that's the Harris Brothers, that's your house in Richmond, that's the pattern book, which is which? Not sure. So, and also they call it the cactus. Who would name a, cereal, a kid home the cactus? <laughs> Buy a house with us and get stuck. <laughs> anyway, and this is another Harris Brothers house. Look at the distinctive uh, uh, bay on the side, three sides, polygon bay. Look at that. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Nice, huh? There's another one, uh, Harris Brothers. Uh oh, what number was that? Whoops, I didn't do a number. Let me, HB 1513. It's all coming back. Anyway, there it is, HB 1513. This is another pattern book house, the Regent. And there it is in the flesh. Another nice match. Uh, we're going to talk about Hopewell very briefly. Now, there's a thing on Sesame Street called One of These Things is Not Like the Other. Anyone seen that? <laughs> I find it very instructive in talking about Hopewell. Okay, pick out the one of these things, it's not like the other. <laughs> these are Sears Magnolia, the creme de la creme of the Sears houses. The big, the grand, there's only nine known magnolias in the whole country, it's a big deal. Actually, there are only six and we found three subsequently. Now, I'm always looking for the magnolia. Maybe there's number 10 out there. But they actually had this listed in an earlier brochure as a Sears Magnolia. I've written some blogs at my website, searshomes.org, urging that perhaps some of the folks in Hopewell might review the Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Haven't heard from them. I actually did put it in my blog, I'd be happy to help them. I think I mentioned that earlier, but I haven't heard from that either. Again, one of these things is not like the other. This is, a, according to the Hopewell brochure, it is a Sears Dover. Ah, wrong button again. Darn it. Yes, 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 whoops! And see, they're looking for me in Hopewell. Look at that one. She's like, Harry, get the gun! She's here! And, you know, part of it is a sense of proportion. Look at the, the gable, that little gabled entry on the Dover. You know, it's short, it's squat, it's long. Look at where it comes into the roof, you know, the clip gables. I mean, there's a lot. Does anyone have any problem with, you know, one of these things is not like the other? Man, that frustrates me. Oh, and in Hopewell, they have kid homes I have never seen anywhere. I've only seen one Winona in the country, and it's in Hopewell. Look at that. Only one I've ever seen. And is there anything about this house? No, not on any of the brochures. Aladdin, Kentucky, there's one in Hopewell. I've seen one, one in Louisa, Virginia. And I mean, I got buddies from here to the West Coast looking for these houses. There's only been two known in the country, one in Hopewell. The Aladdin Brighton, I've only seen one, and it's also in Hopewell. So they've got some incredible, distinctive, beautiful bungalows. They have a lot of Aladdin medicines. They've torn a lot of them down. <laughs> and this, Evelyn Thaw has nothing to do with this story, although if you never get bored, look her up. She's pretty interesting, too. The Richmond Times dispatched a big article on Hopewell recently. Did anyone see it? It made me ready for hard liquor after reading it because here I am in Norfolk and no one asked, no one interviewed me, nobody talked to me, and it just repeated all the same stuff that's wrong. It was very, I wrote letters to the editor, you know, I mean, didn't go anywhere. So, you know, it's, history is sacred and getting it right is sacred and putting it in publishing history is a sacred trust. Get it right. All right, briefly we're gonna talk about Sandstone. We're getting down on time here. Anyone familiar with Sandstone? Seven Pines. 
DuPont had a plant out there. We talked about Peniman earlier. They, one of my favorite pastimes is proving historical markers wrong. <laughs> I said I'm easily entertained. Uh, there are not 230 Aladdin houses in Sandston. It was a Seven Pines plant that DuPont built. The mainly ladies and women who worked there. They would sew the silk bags and they put the propellant in it and the silk, bag, the, the silk bags would go in the big guns. So they built a lot of industrial housing there. Well, here's an old, this is, a, this is a long story, but this is a sales record. And it shows that in Seven Pines, that Owens, Owen Ames Kimball, a contracting company, turned to Aladdin to supply the lumber. And that's all they did was supply the lumber. Aladdin was also known as North American Construction Company. So Owen Ames Kimball goes to Aladdin and says, look, we need all this lumber for all these little houses. And then if you look at the next page, they erected 75 DuPont houses. And what that means is DuPont designs. They were designs that DuPont had made for building at their worker, uh, their villages throughout the country. Anyone heard of Old Hickory, Tennessee? DuPont had a massive mill there, and I think they built, they built hundreds of these little houses. DuPont would go into a village, build housing for the workers, and then start producing munitions. Because it was known in the 20s that uh, industrial housing provided for a more stable workforce. You had less chance of employee turnover to better employees. So they built 75 DuPont houses and 51 painter houses. And I went, oh, I'm crazy. What's a painter house? And then I found out that the architect of record for Seven Pines was a man named W.S. Painter. So that's what a painter house is. It was, in, if you look at that, go back to that. This is from a, a publication called The Report United States Housing Corporation. It was the government who gave the money for DuPont to build the industrial housing at these plants. And as such, the government had a finger in it. And one of their uh, involvements was the bureau architect for Seven Pines, hired by the government, was W.S. Painter. So the 230 Aladdin houses are Aladdin materials, but they're not Aladdin designs. They're designs that came from elsewhere. Oh, there's one. That's a six-room bungalow. There it is in Sandston. And I think, by the way, I think that is the Painter house, because that's the number one most common house in Sandston, slash Seven Pines. Uh, that's the Denver also in Sandston. And these are DuPont designs. Uh, that's uh, Ketchum, and also in Sandston. This is Peniman, we talked about briefly my next book, If I Live That Long, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of books. But it's a fascinating story, Peniman, Virginia, right outside of Williamsburg, it's now uh, gone. But it was uh, 15,000 people lived in Peniman, they made munitions. It was the war to end all wars, we were told, World War I, so when the war was over, they say, ah, we're never gonna make munitions again. Level plant. So Peniman is a fascinating story in Virginia's history. Fascinating. The Magnolia. This is what we're on the lookout for. There's one in Benson, North Carolina. Oh, yeah. This is a vintage picture of the Magnolia from the 1940s. Rose funeral home. That's got a nice sound to it. This is a, a recently discovered Magnolia in Syracuse, New York. Magnolia in northern West Virginia. That's the inside of the Magnolia in West Virginia. That's the inside of a Magnolia in Nebraska. Whoopsie, go back. And it has since been torn down. Torn down in the 1980s, which is a real pity. That is a Magnolia in South Bend, Indiana, vacant and for sale. And this is modern home number 106. I scored this postcard on eBay. I love this because it shows number 106 shortly after it was built. I think father there might have tuberculosis. He's very, very thin. Oh man, if you, I don't know if you can see him. He's really thin. But the reason I include this slide, if the houses looked like they did when built, they'd be a lot easier to identify. Sears homes were simple. And this is a staircase inside a Sears house. When you find some ornate semi-circular staircase, that's not a kid house. These were houses built, about 50% of the Sears homes were built by the uh, homeowner, by the, um, the one who purchased it. About 50% were built by contractors. Again, the hinge, close up of that hinge we talked about. Five PC bracket, that's a distinctive feature of a Sears house. Again, it's not an absolute sign, but it's a clue. 
This bracketing was used on 24 of the most popular Sears house designs. If you ever see that interconnecting stick work, that's often a Sears house. Again, that's what you see on Aladdin is a word. That's what you see on a Sears. Again, the paperwork. And this is a letter. I found a letter in a built-in bookcase in his house talking about you know, the house you just purchased. Ah, the rumors. Where do I begin? But we'll talk about this real briefly. If it has an S on the chimney, it is not a sign. It's a Sears house. That's all over the internet. Oh, oh yeah, send pictures to me if you have a doubt. That's a real picture somebody sent to me. They said, can you identify this? And I said, yes, I think it's a, a silver maple, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I looked at that picture and giggled. Here's another one, another winner. And my favorite. You know, by comparison, this looks great, you know? But yeah, that's, by the way, that's an Aladdin Pasadena back there. Took me a while to figure that one out. We have a group on Facebook called Sears Homes. It's a lot of fun. I started that group by dragging like four of my Facebook friends into it. We're pushing 700 now, so it's become a very popular group. Uh, you can also go to my website, How to Identify Sears Homes, at searshomes.org. Again, if you see this house, stop what you're doing. Do not, you don't even have to come to a safe stop. Well, maybe you do. But get a picture of this house. My attorney husband out there would be having kittens if you didn't say that. It's, a, it's, it's basically an American Foursquare with delusions of grandeur. You know, it's really kind of a silly house. There it is again. And my book, and like I mentioned, oh, I told something about this earlier. The book is 1995. A signed copy of this book sold recently on eBay for 21 bucks. So that signature is worth a buck And if anyone has any questions, we can take some. We can do some questions and answers. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much a given now that everybody can read, but back from Sears uh, and these other uh, companies that were coming out with uh, package houses, when they started, reading was not a, a universal skill. Have you run into any information about difficulties that people faced when they bought these kits, you know, in, in buying these kits, if they were illiterate? Yeah, uh, dealing with illiteracy when you're trying to build a house. The blueprints, the, the 75 page instruction book was actually a lot of more generic. It wasn't for your Sears Avalon. It was for building a kit house. So it didn't say part A goes here, part B goes there. The blueprints were very, very detailed. The blueprints said you're going to put nails every three inches on, you know, on this wall. The blueprint said, uh, it gave a tremendous level of detail. So you would have to have a, a foundational level of literacy. It'd be what we call functionally illiterate today. You didn't have to have reading comprehension, but you had to be able to read words. So I haven't run into that. I mean, everybody, actually, I wonder if literacy levels were better 100 years ago than they are today. <laughs> because a lot of families grew up learning to read with the Holy Bible and the Sears Robot Catalog. A lot of farm households only had those two books. So any other questions? Oh my goodness, yes. The 75 page uh, book, we read somewhere that it was leather bound and gold embossed with the name of the purchaser. I've they heard both, that too. They float around at all? Do you have a lot of those float around? I, I, I bought one on eBay. Uh, I think it was over $300. And it was a paper cover. So I haven't seen the leather one with the name's owner embossed in gold. And I don't know if they're out there or not, but I've never seen one. I've, I've seen three of them total now, and they all just had. The paper covers. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the How would the average person do masonry? Uh, as I mentioned, about 50% of the time people built these homes themselves. And about 50% they would hire somebody. And there's also all manner of um, in between, you can hire somebody to do your brickwork, hire somebody to do your foundation, and then you know do the rest yourself. And often, when I go into Sears' house and it has unusually ornate stonework or brickwork, you can go back to the city directory and find out the first homeowner was a stonemason. You know, like, oh, that makes sense. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I understand how if you get inside the house, mm -hmm. you you can 
get a much better idea of whether it's truly a kit home or not. Right. But I was wondering, is there a way, you know, when you're doing a, like a windshield survey, is there a way to tell the difference between an actual kit home and a contractor's copy of the blueprints? Uh, is there a way to tell the difference between a contractor's, a contractor's copy and an original authentic kit home? Yes, there is. Um, it's kind of a detailed answer, and I know we're short on time. Uh, in short, you should look for marked lumber. Uh, you should look for uh, 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 there's uh, labels on the back of millwork, uh, house uh, the, the house footprint. If if, if if the Avalon is 28 by 32, and that's not what it is, the house you're looking at should be 28 by 32. And that's one of my gripes with some of the local historians. Absent documentation, you cannot call it a kid house just because it kind of looks like one. Mm -hmm. If you think it is, you need to get inside and look for the marks on the lumber and look for the labels on the back of the millwork and make sure the room dimensions are precise down to the inch. And if you have that, you can't, uh, there was a, a group that did a survey recently and oh, they came up with uh, uh, dozens of, uh, what did they call them, uh, unknown model of Sears homes, and they admitted at the end they were just looking for houses with exposed rafter tails. You can't do that, and if you don't have documentation, if you don't have an old sales order, or if you can't find marks, then it's not a Sears home, and that really does frustrate me. You know, I said in, uh, in, my, in one of my blogs just that I wrote yesterday, there's 70,000 Sears homes in the country, but judging by my mail, you'd think there are about 70 million. And I had one lady get really angry with me at a lecture. She came up and she said, I want to show you a picture of my Sears house. What model is it? And I looked at the picture. She was an elderly woman, <clears throat> cobbled up with a little aluminum cane. And I looked at the picture and I said, well, ma'am, I'm sorry I can't help you, but that's not a Sears model that I recognize. Well, she handed it back to me and she said, honey, I think you need to take another look. <laughs> Where do you go with that? So, yes, it's a tough question. And one thing I wanted to mention, um, they, uh, on the talk tonight, I would love to come back and do a, another talk. I know I haven't found all the Sears homes, so if anyone has any ideas for how to make that happen, it'd be great. I'd love to go to Hopewell. I, you know, I'd love to honestly help them out. It pains me that their brochures are in error. Uh, in my opinion, what, where's my husband? Uh, their brochures have statements with which I do not agree. So I'd love to find a way to come back to Richmond, do a little more research, you know, uh, turn a few more people on to the thrill of Sears Homes. If there, are there any other questions? One last question? Yes, ma'am. Actually, yeah, the uh, sheetrock product was developed in 1912. It was called Good Wall Sheet Plaster. And it was actually made of uh, five fiber cement or something. And that's one of the signs you might have a kid home if you find good wall sheet plaster. But typically they were lath and plaster, just traditional lath and plaster and with cattle hair, horse hair. So anyway, uh, thank you very much and don't forget the books. <laughs>